welcome Jim Pugh, Chairman of the Board of the Dr. Phillips Center, to get us started. Thank you, Mass. I'm sure everybody does. Thank you for being here. It's a big day. It's a huge day. And we're proud to have you here. 18 years ago, Buddy Dyer was getting elected mayor of Orlando. And the night before, he and I were sitting in a meeting, and we knew he was going to win. And so we started talking about all the things that Orlando and Central Florida needed. And uh, he said, well, we, we've got to have a new arena. I said, how about a performing arts center? He said, if you'll do it, I'll do it. And that's how I got the job. <laughs> it's been a long and grand adventure. And uh, today we celebrate the opening of the Steinmetz and Chuck and Margie are here and you're going to hear from them. But uh, some of our largest donors were public donors. The county pitched in big time and Jerry Dennings is here. You'll hear from him and uh, the city put in with a small fortune. And uh, that turned out pretty well. So uh, then came the Dr. Phillips Charities Foundation and we're proud to uh, be a part of that. Some of our board members are here. I'd like to have them stand up. Just uh, stay standing and we'll we will uh, applaud all of you at one time. Chuck, Steinmetz, please. Ed Timberlake. Linda Chapman, Sybil Pritchard, is Sybil here? There she is. Thank you, Sybil. Bill Ors. Hey, Bill. Frank Santos, I know Frank's here. Jim Shapiro, Harvey Coburn, Anil Desponte, and Irving Matthews. Give them a big hand. <laughs> Donors are here, Mary and Frank Doherty, Pete, Pete and Fran uh, Weldon, and Connie and Bill Neville there. Yes, so Phil and Connie. So uh, with, I'd like to just say thank you to each and every one of you. This is what you're standing or sitting in or standing, some of you. This is $600 million. And when we added it all up, our budget was, I think, about $602 million. So we're, we're pretty damn close. <laughs> and I, I don't know if that's been done before, but we pulled off a miracle, I suppose. In a few minutes, you're going to see this inside of the Steinmetz. It's, uh, when you walk in there the first time, you go like that. It's just absolutely gorgeous. Uh, anyway, you've had enough for me. I'd like to introduce Buddy, Buddy Dyer, the best mayor of any city in the world. Thank you, Jim, and good afternoon to everybody. It's great to have you here today. Uh, what a wonderful day. Around City Hall, we um, talk about these and the days that we live for. Some of them are bad days. And some of them are good days, and today's an especially good day, so these are the days that we live for. Um, you know, and it's a wonderful day for our arts groups, for our city, for our county, for our entire community to realize a dream and make it into a reality. And most of what Jim said was true. <laughs> it was definitely 18, maybe close to 19 years ago. Um, but. Jim Pugh had, never, had been extremely supportive of me during every endeavor that I've ever made and had never asked me for a single thing other than to lead this effort. So think about him in 2003 and the uh, finalization or the completion of this wonderful hall that's world class. Probably um, my estimation is if not the best in the world, it's certainly in the top three or four. So to have that in Orlando is particularly significant. And uh, when I first became mayor, the publisher of the newspaper told me that she thought that Orlando had a little bit of an inferiority complex, that 
we sometimes settled for less than the very best and less than world class. And a few years later, she came back and said, I don't believe that anymore. Now we strive to be the best because somebody has to be the best. And I think that of the venues that we have completed, they're all top notch. Um, this one's one of the best in the world. The, the Amway Center, one of the best arenas in the world. And for the money we have in Camping World Stadium, I think it's one of the best. Spend $250 million versus a couple billion dollars and we have an NFL quality stadium. But I want to uh, thank the leadership, government and community leaders. Mayor Demings, thank you for all the participation from the county. Um, I see Byron over there, he was on our team when we started this and he gets to finish it on your team. So sorry for him that he's over there, but he's <laughs> <laughs> um, And I'm gonna let you introduce your county commissioners, but I want to recognize our city commissioners that are here, Commissioner Gray, newly re-elected Commissioner Stewart, landslide Stewart, and Commissioner Sheehan. Thank you for your support and um, continued hard work on this. Of course, Jim has recognized the board of directors, and I want to likewise recognize the Steinmetz family, the Greens, certainly Jim Pugh, and all the generous donors. Um, this was a dream, and it didn't start with me. This goes all the way back to Mayor Frederick. Um, who purchased some part of this land. The city already owned some of it when I became mayor. We eventually, well, there was talk of building it just on the front block, um, and we had a fire station that was on the south block, which we decided we needed to uh, either renovate or build a new station, and it allowed us to uh, acquire both blocks, and I think what has uh, been able to be produced because we bought or acquired all the land is significantly different and better than what we would have had if we had simply built it on that one block out there. It opened in 2015. We had some challenges uh, getting there. We had to split the building into two pieces. Kathy will probably tell you a little bit more about that. Um, but we're finally to the finish line. And this is the, the, the building that will house all of our resident arts groups. So um, I think when we split them, we knew that it'd be easier to fundraise for this one than for the big hall, because the big hall is the money generator um, for Broadway, and this hall is the one that everybody loves for our, all our local groups. So it's great to finally, finally get here. So again, I just want to thank everybody that's involved in any way uh, in this building. So with that, I would like to introduce, you know what, before I do that, and Kathy Ramsberger was the third member of the team. She was on my staff at the time and went as executive on loan to Jim, and it was just the three of us at the beginning. And all those years later, uh, here's Kathy, and what a great job she's done. Let's give her a big hand. <laughs> and now I would like to introduce the mayor of Orange County. I think the city and the county have never had a better relationship uh, than we've had during the course of the last couple of years. And, I envision that that would go on for some time to come. Mayor Jerry Dimmons. Uh, good afternoon to all of you, and uh, thank you to Mayor Dyer. I uh, will agree with you, Jim, that he's the best uh, city mayor in the nation. <laughs> uh, this is exciting news today, uh, but I am joined by members of the Board of County Commission, and we'll start with Cadero, Commissioner Bonilla, and Commissioner Sibley. Now, if I have missed some of our county commissioners, uh, okay. yeah. so Orange County has long been a great partner with the Dr. Phillips Performing Arts Center here since its inception, and we have committed funding through the Tourist Development Council to help bring this project to fruition. We are proud to be one of the top destinations in the world for visitors. Now, we will not only be known for the finest hospitality, exciting theme parks, sports venues, and one of the largest convention centers in the nation, but we will also be known as one of the greatest communities for the arts and cultural attractions with this edition today. A stand
state of the art performing arts hall will be enriching and contribute significantly to our economy and quality of life. We are thrilled to support the center as we continue to elevate the status of arts and culture here in Central Florida. Through our partnership with Mayor Dyer, the City of Orlando, and the Dr. Phillips Performing Arts Center, we are creating a culture where a diverse and thriving arts community is essential. We look forward to the memorable experiences that our residents and visitors will share at this remarkable, one of a kind, performing arts themes. Now, I'd like to introduce the namesakes behind this diamonds hall, philanthropists and fellow board member, Chuck and Marjorie Paps Steinmetz. part of the city was an opera hall. It was their most important structure, and it was built in 1860. And from that time forward, for 150 years, everybody came to the opera. That was the biggest thing that could happen in the community. And it made me think about, that's what's happened here. You know, finally, we have something that is the center part of the city. It's, it's going to be, as the mayor said, you know, it's going to be known all over the country that Orlando has a performing arts center better than any place else. And uh, that makes it so exciting. I wanted to mention that getting the project started was challenging. A lot of things that uh, were supposed to happen didn't happen. But anyways, one thing that we did know is if we could dig the hole, nobody would fill it in. <laughs> and, and that's uh, pretty much uh, how it worked. Interestingly enough, of the uh, Mary Palmer, we were, uh, Kathy and I were invited to the uh, uh, Philharmonic board meeting uh, before the project really got out of the ground. And the first question that they asked was, are you all gonna really build this? And I said, absolutely. There's no question we're going to get it done. And at that point, we went out and started raising money, and uh, a lot of money, because it became more and more expensive. And, uh, and it just made it so much more meaningful. So this is a day of uh, great pride and fulfillment for Margie and me. have to lower the microphone. <laughs> oh, it's so good to see you all. Thank you for coming. Thanks to all these visionaries behind me. Um, it's an amazing day, and all I can say to begin is, woohoo! <laughs> I'd like to tell a story today as well, and it has to do with, uh, as Kathy came up with, Arts for Every Life, that's been the byline, the center. Um, and it's so significant because as Mayor Dennings mentioned, this is for everyone, this is for everybody in our diverse community. I would like to pose another comment on Arts for Every Life. I think it's all about the arts for every artist in our community as well. And here's my story. Two days ago, I was talking with a colleague from Central Florida Community Arts. His name is Terrence Hunter. Terrence, are you in the audience today? There he is, there he is, okay. So, here comes Terrence's story. Terrence is the Vice President of Operations, Operations and Education at Central Florida Community Arts. So, Terrence shared with me that just a few days ago, he had had the opportunity to be on the stage at Steinman's Hall. And he was with some of his colleagues and associates. 
and he could tell they were quite overcome with emotion, as we know you all will be when you walk in the hall today. And Terrence said, I said to one of them, you know what? You don't have to leave Orlando to feel like you've been like to the best place in the world. You can practice your art right here at home in Orlando. And if you go to New York and you want to go to Carnegie Hall and go to London, that's fine. But you can dream right here at home. And I just think that's the best story. It's been resonating with me for the last two days. So thank you for that, too. <laughs> so arts for every artist and arts for every life. Thank you all for coming. And now it's our pleasure to introduce our president and CEO, Kathy Ramsford. to be here today. I always love the stories. I have one that uh, just happened a month ago. We had a board meeting on Steinmetz stage. Uh, it was a great moment because these wonderful people that have given us so much time, much more than they ever anticipated, were sitting in a room that they uh, have been available to be part of for almost 19 years. And there's been many, many boards that have been behind this project because it's evolved. Actually, another board member that's here is actually Mr. Bryce West. He, he pulled away for a long time there, too. But after the meeting, it's quiet, Chuck Steinitz came up to Jim and I and grabbed us both and kind of put us in headlocks. <laughs> and uh, he started crying. He said, I am so happy. He was so happy to give us this gift that's going to be here for hundreds of years for our children's children. And that type of philanthropy and that type of love that you have for your community reflects a great deal of people that actually live here. When we started, people said, you're never going to raise any type of money. And that's just not true. We have builders in this community. It's led by two builders of mayors that we have. Mayor Dyer is probably one of the greatest builders in, uh, in his core of any city mayor. And Mayor Demings is just the same. Even before he became mayor, I think you were a builder. And of course, we know Jim Pugh. He's, he's built, built communities all over the country with his business epic property. So a big takeaway from me, every great journey, the most important thing are the people that you do it with. And I have to say, I'm extremely blessed to have the chance to, to be just a small part of it. So, you know, the spirit of innovation and passion and perseverance is really reflective of this project, I'd have to say. It's the quality of the building. I think that's the one thing that Jim actually asked me. He says, I want you to have a winning season every single year. And that had nothing to do with uh, just the financial balance sheet, but I'm happy to say we did that. You know, it's, it's about excellence. And what is the next level of excellence? And that has to do with the commitment of this, uh, of this region. And it couldn't happen without collaboration as well. So in 2007, we worked on this from 2003 to 7 to put a business plan together, and we presented the business plan in 2007. And I'm actually happy to say, if you were to read that business plan, we stayed the course. And it wasn't easy, but we stayed the course, with the exception of having to divide the building. So there's a great phrase, a good house is never finished. That kind of happened to us in 2009. We had to divide something and be real patient to get it done, and it cost a lot more money, but boy, Staying the course, there was even more valuable because of what we have today. And you know what? We made a promise to the community. We, and and that, that, that promise really, we, we delivered it. And there's a sense of responsibility when you work with partners and you work with people that give your time. We have 14,000 donors that have given us a gift, whether it's $5 or $35 million. And we gave, made a promise to them. And I have to say, of the colleagues that work here, we live by that promise. Every day I come to work, I realize someone does not have to give us a gift. And we have to deliver the promise. And the better opportunity is, is we have the chance to work in a place where we can actually make a difference. And that difference in six short years, we've had over two and a half million people come through those front doors. And that was in, with intent. We wanted everybody to come to the front door of the art center, not separate doors to the center. We wanted to break down the barriers of elitism. 
and the exclusivity that sometimes is centered around artistic expression. You know, can it be for everybody? And we think that it can, we believed it. We dropped the building six feet in the ground in Florida, which was very expensive, just so nobody would walk up to the arts. And that's how important our purpose was. We've had over 2,400 shows and events just in six years. We've actually been recognized with international awards because we're so active, we're alive, and we have our mission that we live by. Every year we have over 600 uh, curtains. That's a lot of work in here. And this project is hard, it should be alive every day. We say that to our team when we're tired, but it's worth it. Of those 600, 150 are from our regional groups. This is the place for local artists. It is a place where everyone can rise, whether it's an international artist or a regional artist. Many of those uh, local arts organizations are here with us today. The Bach Festival in Rollins are here. ECU Chorale is here. Central Florida Community Arts, of course. Dancing with Diabetes, Dancers Point. Flamingo de Sol, Orlando Opera, a Opera Orlando. Um, Orlando Ballet, Orlando Philharmonic, Pachaca Cha which is, that's probably the first time I've said it correctly. <laughs> um, Phantasmagoria, standing ovation, and of course UCF, a big partner of ours. And you know what, going back to uh, going through a journey, everyone that has been, a, that's touched this project feels like it's theirs. Two weeks ago I had a corporate partner come in to talk with us, and he was saying, you know what, I just, we, we got this done. He, he's, we, this is the best, I've been watching this, and. I've been cheering this on, and we did this, we did this. And he looked at me and he goes, and this is the first time I've been in this building. He had ownership to something that he'd never been part of because it was built by the community. He had the chance to at least feel like he was part of it. So Jess Spears is gonna lock him in as a sponsor. <laughs> anyway, so this project was built by the community, and it's an endeavor filled with passion and purpose. Um, and now it's ready, really ready for the whole world experience. And with that, we wanna show you a quick video.
line up over a couple weeks, but today we're going to announce several, as you just saw. Um, on January 14th, it all begins um, as we unveil one of the greatest halls in the world. And I know that a lot of people can say we're number one, we're number one. Um, I think that Damien, Dory, and Millie Dixon, uh, Damien's our acoustician, Millie Dixon has been with us for, both of them have been with us for just about 19 years. Uh, and they can tell you, and they are here, of where this hall ranks in the world. And we asked them to deliver a perfect hall, and I think that they, they have. And uh, you'll, have, you'll see that in a minute. So we're going to continue the work just over the next two weeks uh, when we open the building. Over 600 regional and international artists will share the stage. The grand celebration will kick off with a one-of-a-kind collaboration that we're so happy to talk about. Not only is there going to be a ribbon cutting, but that's, that night we have a, um, a production called Rise and Shine that the Dr. Phillips Center is going to produce. It's going to be on Friday the 14th and the 16th, and we're even more happy to say that Colney Smith is directing this, and Eric Jacobson is going to be our music director and lead over 250 of Orlando's best on the world stage. They'll be here to talk about it. The Royal Philharmonic has, they have participated and toured around the world, but they've never done a 10-day residency anywhere. And what we really wanted to do is, this hall transforms into a lot of different shapes, and how do you celebrate different types of music? So what's unique is, we're going to do unique performances with these artists, the ones that we're mentioning today, where they're going to have a chance just to work by themselves, with their art form, with the Royal Phil. So on, on uh, the 19th of January, the Royal Ballet with eight of the principal dancers will be here uh, and do a performance. They have never performed together. The Royal Ballet and the Royal Philharmonic have never performed together. It's a premiere here. On January 20th, uh, Leon Bridges will be here with the Royal Phil. Jennifer Hudson is that Saturday night, and again, all with the Royal Phil. Then on Sunday, uh, Beethoven's Night will be performed and the Bach Festival Choir will be here to support that. Then we have Lyle Lovett coming. And then on the 26th, we're producing with Princeton Entertainment, Duke Ellington's Black, Brown, and Beige, along with Sacred Music. This has never been performed before. This is a Dr. Phillips Center for this. So even though we're a place for a lot of external organizations to come, we're also creative content. We, con we create wonderful education content with re uh, youth productions. ELF is just right around the corner. It's being led by our education team. The Applause Awards is remarkable. We have a jazz orchestra. Um, this is another, not only is Rise and Shine, a Dr. Phillips Center production, but also Black, Brown, and Beige that we're co-presenting with Princeton Entertainment. After Steinmetz Hall, the grand celebration actually continues because we just started construction on the interiors of Judson's. Joyce and Judson Green gave us a gift after they had the chance to see a remarkable room um, at Jazz at Lincoln Center. It's called Dizzy's. And it feels great when you walk in there because you're sitting at a cabaret table and you're enjoying music for 50 minutes or so and uh, you're just in a quality room. Uh, it's very, very intimate for emerging art forms. I believe Damien was the acoustician for that room too, weren't you? There he was. Okay. So, uh, so beyond that, that will be opened uh, next May, another celebration. So some of the exciting series that you saw up there, uh, this is throughout the entire building, seven Broadway shows. Our next season is also remarkable, actually eight. Uh, we have six comedy shows, classical, jazz, uh, film, and family. The Freedom Series is something we've always done. Um, but we, we named it with the opportunity of the Front Yard Festival, and that's really about uh, wonderful expression of African American artists. Uh, we also have a dance series, and we hope to bring back the Front Yard Festival next fall, completely envisioned. COVID free, right? right? That's the goal. So, perseverance is a reality, just so you know, the design team actually over 100 workers per day for almost four and a half years. 1.3 million hours of labor in Steinmetz Hall alone. Not a typical construction project. And to get all this done in this building, we've had over 365 volunteers. You know, to get this done, you know, and I, I sometimes have a lot of chances to be up here um, speaking on behalf of the success of the project, but I have to say it's really because of a remarkable team. Building a building was hard. Building a great team is probably a lot harder. 
and uh, also uh, building a culture. And I think that they contribute that every day. Cecilia Kelly is our CFO. These are all rock stars, by the way. Spencer Tong is our EDP of operations. Alexis Jackson uh, leads our development team. Mary Beth Harufka is our people and culture. Sherry Peterson is our marketing, PR, and creative. Jess Beers leads our partnerships. So if you, if you have a business and you're here, she's going to be tracking you down. <laughs> and then all this content has been led, especially for the opening, by Ed Cassis. Um, he's with Princeton Entertainment Group, but he's been a consultant of ours and a, a true team, team member of, uh, of this organization since actually before day one. We are working on tuning and commissioning the hall. We can talk about that when we get inside. There's not many chances for anybody to see the theater because there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. But today we're going to have a chance to go in and take a look at it. And I hope you guys enjoy what you see. And remember, a good house is never finished, but we're almost there. Okay, so January 14th is, is when we're going to be able to kick it off. I'm <laughs> how this is going to work. 
and he took me through the, the process. They had just been working with drawings at that particular point. And then we, we could tell how complicated this was going to be. And, uh, but that was a great experience, and then I've seen him a number of times since then. And I think he's really thrilled and delighted with actually what he designed and what we've created. It was, you know, because of COVID, he couldn't come. And when he walked through the door for the first time, just a quick COVID uh, story. In March of 2020 is when all the finishes were supposed to come to the building. All of the woodwork in here is from Canada. We couldn't get it. Our chairs were from Colombia. Our lighting is from Italy. And our tiles from China. So we, we got caught in a timing situation that it wasn't favorable. And we couldn't come see it anyway, but when he walked through those doors, he, he did start crying too. So it's a, it's a, a, long, a, a long journey for him, and, and uh, I think he's happy with what he's seeing. So we keep saying that this is a perfect hall. We think it's perfect, okay? And we believe that it's perfect from a sound perspective because of what we invested in that. Damien, uh, I'm going to ask him to tell you a little bit about the sound of isolation in here, but the remarkable part about this building, which is really unique, is this hall is more than one space, it's more than one configuration. All the chairs that you're sitting in actually flip upside down, and they move differently, and this becomes a flat floor at the stage level, or where you're sitting here. So this could have a mosh pit if you wanted one, or it could have a flat floor for a cabaret, or a gala event. Um, where we can extend the stage in different ways. And it also has a massive piece of architecture that moves, which I'm gonna have Millie talk about on, on just uh, how we achieve that. Uh, it's, I think it's 100 million pounds, 500 tons, right? Okay, and we have train tracks that this piece of architecture moves on. For those of you that are in the media, there's a media package that we're gonna share with you where you can actually see how this room changes. So why it's kind of a trifecta and it hasn't really happened anywhere is because one, we went for an N1 sound rating. Two, we have a flat floor. And three, we have two different theater configurations. And this all started with our local groups. We said, if they're gonna be in a, a hall and we're gonna put this much into it, it ought to be the right hall for that form of music. And so the concert configuration, or for this that you see now, is for orchestras from all over the world, but it's also for the Philharmonic and others to enjoy right here as a concert hall. And then there's a huge proscenium uh, configuration uh, that uh, uh, both the opera and ballet and many theater productions can have in here. Millie, do you want to just talk a little bit about how the theater works and lives and your perspective of this hall? I do. Certainly. So what you're looking at here is essentially what we call the concert uh, setup. Um, as Kathy mentioned, all of these uh, lifts, this uh, stage deck here in each row um, has the ability to become a flat floor or part of the stage. It's all variable. And from about this position here back, this entire unit travels upstage and retreats into storage when that happens, the roof uh, ceiling flips up and the entire stage house, like you would see over uh, the Disney Theater, opens up into the room. And we have a big portal that comes down and then frames the proceeding of opening at that time. So how do you open a theater that has multiple different shapes? That's why it's over two weeks and we have many different types of performances in here. So when you come to the opening, this may be in proscenium form, or it might be in concert form, or in the case of Rise and Shine, um, that's being led by Colleen Smith, it might be a little bit of a combination of both. So from an acoustic perspective, Daniel, you want to give us a few words? Sure. Um, so, hi. Uh, Jim asked me to explain a little bit what we do, what we're doing right now, which is sometimes call it tuning the hall, and a lot of it is measurements, and uh, it's really getting an understanding of how the little fine granular adjustments change the acoustic space. So uh, we've been doing a series of measurements in this zone so far, and this is starting to be a little changing over to all different modes and just different things. But the, the goal is to understand if you have an orchestra on stage that's a small orchestra versus a medium orchestra versus a large orchestra or something that's Mozart versus Faulkner, 
Thank you. 